Welcome to the seventh and final module of this Baseball 5 webinar. In this module, we'll go through the basic game preliminaries, game strategies, and basic practice planning. But we'll begin with a look at the lineup card. Similar to baseball and softball, in Baseball 5, coaches or team managers have to fill out the lineup card and present it to the game officials before each game. Depending on the rules of the event, the lineup card must be presented somewhere between 15 and 90 minutes prior to the start of the game. It's important to have it prepared and delivered on time, as it supports the organizers and delivers an image of organization and discipline which is reflected on the team. Now let's see how to fill out the lineup card. Under Starters, Write the first and last names of the five players in the starting lineup. The order, one through five, is the batting order. The bottom three lines on the left-hand side are for the reserve players, the substitutes. Remember, in WBSC official competitions, the lineup must include at least two athletes per gender. Therefore, the column to the right of the players' names is where to indicate their genders. The full roster of eight players shall be composed of four male and four female athletes. The third and final column for the players is for their uniform numbers, and that is to the right of the boxes for their genders. The right side of the lineup card is pretty self-explanatory. You're asked to write the name of the competition, location, date of the game, number or code of the game in the competition, and the names of the two teams, home and visitor. The bottom right-hand corner is reserved for the name of your team, the name of the manager or head coach, and his or her signature. It's really very simple. But remember, be clear when you write, because the table official will have to copy everything on the lineup card, and we don't want them to misspell any names. The WBSC social media channels will often publish the lineup card as well. So again, we ask you to write clearly. Now we'll talk about game strategies. As you know by now, Baseball 5 is a game of speed and quick reactions. Nevertheless, being based on baseball and softball, it's also a highly strategic game. Athletes and coaches need to be able to recognize and adapt quickly to the different game situations. And to help us do that, we're now going to watch an entire Baseball 5 game. This game was played two years ago in Cuba at the beginning of the Baseball 5 experience. Since then, some things have changed in terms of the rules and the field, but it's still an example of a high-level game where we can observe a variety of situations. We'll now move on to the game itself. If you want to watch it online with commentary, you can do that. But for our purposes, we're going to mute it. So welcome again to Havana, Cuba, the first ever Baseball 5 tournament, the final game of that tournament. And we're ready to begin We're ready, but was the defense ready? You saw that ground ball bounce off the defender and wind up in the stands. So the runner was awarded an extra base. Today, that runner would just be safe at first, but the rules as they were back then permitted him an extra base. Now there's a ball that's grounded to second, and the throw goes into the same set of stands. There was a little bit of a miscommunication. There was a defender breaking down the third base line to cover home plate, but the throw missed him, so the ball went out of play. That would be the same today. The batter would be awarded second base. And we move on with nobody out and a run already in, but there's a line drive that resulted in a double play. A hard hit ball that was caught, and then the tag was applied to the runner. So very quickly now we have two outs. And now a ground ball to third, 
with an accurate throw to first for the out that ends the top half of the first inning. You saw how quickly things moved in that inning and how quickly things changed. It got off to a very fast start. A couple of quick runs, or a couple of quick base runners, I should say, and one quick run. But then the defense tightened up, and now we're in the bottom of the first. And you see a leadoff hit go through the right side. Throw to first base, not in time. I want you to notice the gray team's defensive alignment. They have a player pulled in on the B5 portion of the Baseball 5 logo. That was a nice defensive play to get the force out at second base for the first out of the bottom of the first inning. And again, you see three defenders on the right side. That one was hit to the left side and the same result. A force out at second base. Two outs in the bottom of the first inning. The pink team batting, trailing one to nothing. This ball goes right up the middle, and it's a very easy play for the midfielder. That was not a good example of a well-placed hit. Hit it right at the defender. So after one complete inning in just a couple of minutes, the gray team leads it one to nothing. Pretty quick first inning, huh? We move along, and we start the second with a fine defensive play. That ball was hit deep in the hole at short, but a strong, accurate throw, resulting in the first out. Second play, out at first base. And you notice the defender there made a quick underhand flip to first base. That's an important tool in every defender's repertoire. Now we have a ball bounced on the left side, got through to the wall, winds up in the stands, and again, that player was awarded second base. He would not have been awarded second base today. And there the runner left early from second. So the out was called on the base runner leaving early, not on the hit. That was the third out of the inning. It was costly too, because if the base runner hadn't left early, he had a very good chance of scoring. Instead, we're on to the bottom of the second. The gray team still leading one to nothing. That was an easy play for that drawn-in infielder. One out. The batter adjusted his feet before the hit, and he's safe at first. He took a look at the defense, decided where he wanted to hit it, hit it there, and then hustled up the first base line. So a man on first with one out. Now ground ball. Goes through the defenders on the right side between first and second base. And now all of a sudden, something brewing for the pink team, first and second, with just one out. Now a ball smashed through the midfielder. That'll bring in a run. And good hustle by the batter to turn it into a double. It's a run-scoring double, and the game is tied. All of a sudden, it's the makings of a big inning for the pink team. That's another base hit. And maybe you see the runner there. He went halfway down the third base line, but then stopped and retreated to third base. That was because of the good defense, good communication by the gray team. They had somebody ready at home plate. Kept a run off the board. And now we get a ground ball up the middle. And it's a double play to end the inning. So good recovery by Gray. After the pink team had pushed a couple of runs across to take the lead. Big takeaway from that inning. One for offense and one for defense. On offense, where you place the ball, how you hit it, so important. And on defense, communication is key. You have to be vocal and work with your teammates. So now we start the third inning. And he didn't even run up the first base line on that hit because he was ruled out by the home plate official for stepping on the lines of the batter's box. 
Now a close play at first. Out at first base. Nice, clear, decisive call by the official. So we have two outs very quickly in the top of the third. Here's a well-hit ball. And good hustle up the first base line to beat out the throw. Safe at first base. A two-out base runner. These officials did an excellent job maintaining control of the game. Emotions were running high. Again, we have two outs in the top of the third. And a force out at second ends the inning. So on we go into the bottom of the third inning. It's a tight game. Good defense. The great team continues to employ a different strategy. They have that defender in on the blacktop. First batter leads off. With a ball that winds up in the outfield, that is a leadoff base hit. The pink team were really masters of surveying the defense. Except right here. He hit it right at the first baseman who made the catch and then applied the tag on the base runner, turning it into a double play. Terrific work there by the first baseman. Now a base hit to extend this bottom half of the third inning. And a poorly placed ball for the force out at second to end the inning. So though the inning began promisingly enough with a base hit, good defense, especially that great play by the first baseman, kept it from being a big inning. On we go into the fourth. Still a tight one. 2-1 the score. Ground ball off the wall. And a smart decision not to try and force a throw to first base. Lead off single. So that's the tying run aboard. Force out at second. First out of the inning. And again, wise decision. Don't throw it to first if you know you can't make a play. All you do there is risk an error. So smart not to make that throw. Now we have a ground ball to second. Underhand flip out there. Throw to first, not in time. That throw obviously was made because the runner was far enough away from first base that the defender felt they could make an out. Obviously it didn't work out. But there are two outs in the inning. And now with another underhand flip from the second baseman, the side is retired in the top of the fourth. So the great team, remember, had a one nothing lead, two batters into the game. But now going into the bottom of the fourth inning, they trail 2-1. to one. They've had nothing going offensively, so they can really not afford to fall any further behind. But as you'll see in this fourth inning, the pink team really puts the pressure on, and they don't let up. Leadoff batter smacks a single between the shortstop and third baseman. Leadoff man aboard. Watch the batter. Look at how he surveys the field, taking note of where the defenders are. Some players just step in and hit it, but watch this. Checks out the alignment, picks his spot, repositions his feet, and hits it exactly where he wanted to, between the first baseman and second baseman, for a second consecutive hit. If there's one thing you remember about this, this video to teach your players, let it be that moment. How important it is as a batter, not just to whack it, but to do it with purpose. And that was just a little ground out to first base. But the runners advanced, so it's second and third with one away. Now watch for something here. We're going to see a base hit. And then the defender is going to try and get time. But it won't be granted. 
There's the base hit. Run scores. Player asks for time. Time was not granted, and that's really smart base running by the batter to scoot into second base there. The great team still contesting that they tried to ask for time, but as you've learned already, it's up to the officials to grant time, and they didn't feel the ball was dead. So a great job by the officials. Run scored. It's 3-1 now. And we're going to have an out for an illegal hit. It was a well-struck ball. But an infraction by the batter for the second out of the inning. And now the players go back to second base and third base. It's a 3-1 game, two outs, bottom of the fourth. And a really well-struck ball on the left side. Brings in another run, so it's 4-1. to one. And remember, in the bottom of the fourth, as the home team with a lead, you're just trying to put on some insurance runs, make it that much harder for the visitor to come back in the top of the fifth. That one bounced off the defender and then hit the wall. And watch the confusion that ensues. But the officials are going to make the right call here. They're going to say it was a valid hit. And that rubbing of the hands together tells you why. A defender touched it before it hit the fence, even though it didn't bounce. If it had hit the fence directly without touching a defender, then that would be an out. But it went off the defender before it went off the wall, so everybody's safe. The run scores. It is now 5-1, and the batter is brought back to first base. You see the gray team starting to get frustrated. Now ground ball at the feet of the drawn-in second baseman. That's another smart bit of hitting. Try to hit it at the defender's feet. It's the toughest place to catch it. Base hit, and it is all of a sudden a 6-1 game. Now we have the ninth batter of this bottom of the fourth inning coming up. And he stepped on the batter's box. The camera cut away there. You see a little friendly bump at second base, but that didn't matter. He was called out by the home plate official for stepping on the lines of the batter's box, but the damage was done. Six to one, a five-run bottom of the fourth inning. Has the pink team on the verge of claiming the first ever baseball five championship. We'll see what kind of a fight we get from the gray team here in the fifth inning. They need five to tie it. Or six to take a lead. Either way, they would force a bottom half of the fifth. Not a good start. Batter was ruled out for stepping on the lines of the batter's box. Attention to detail. So important in this game. That's another out without any work done by the defense. It was a ball lined directly off the outfield fence. So two outs. The offensive players eliminating themselves. On those first two hits. Now a little bit of a careless defensive play. A poor throw. An error. So the batter's awarded an extra base. He goes to second with two outs. And there's still a little hope alive for the gray team. Now here's a ball that gets through to defenders. Bounces off the wall. The throw to home plate. And the tag at home plate for the out that ends the ball game. And really remember that play too. Shows you how important communication is and preparation is by your defense. That was a very well-coached, well-prepared pink team. They had a man ready to cover the plate to receive the throw. And also, think about the fact that the base runner slowed down a little bit. If he'd kept running hard, there's a pretty good chance he would have beaten that out and the game would have continued. But hats off to the pink team for a really well-played game. So before we dive into this slide and hitting strategy, just a couple of notes. Hope you enjoyed the breakdown of that game. And as you saw and as you will continue to learn, there's no special plan to win games. Every team just needs to be prepared mentally and physically. And they have to be able to recognize the weaknesses and the strategy of the opponent. A good coach is someone who can adapt their game to the skills of his or her athletes. Of course, in the end... The quality of the players will be the deciding factor in who wins the games. And the quality of players is dependent on their talent and their hard work. How much work are they willing to put in? 
There's no substitute for practice. And we'll talk about practice again at the end of this slide, the end of this presentation. But now we're going to move on and start with a closer look at hitting strategy. So the one you see on the screen here is in a situation with no runners on base. So this is how every inning will start. We have the defenders in this image in a relatively basic formation. In fact, an extremely basic formation. Most of the time, when batting with no runners on, the batter tries to find the gap along the third base line or in between the third baseman and shortstop because even if the defensive player fields the ball there, that's the longest throw that they have to make. And as you just saw in the example game, sometimes with good speed, a player can beat that out, even if it is a good throw. And you see we have the cones in red, numbers one and two. From a previous presentation, you remember the cone drills where your batters get comfortable hitting in those places between defenders. If you have a lefty batter up with nobody on and nobody out, maybe they try to pull it along the first baseline. But usually you won't see a left-handed leadoff batter. So yeah, you get used to this target practice. And during a game, you may start identifying weaker defenders. And perhaps this could change your strategy, but this is a good way to start. One note on that. Female players often have very good reflexes and quick reaction times, quicker in some cases than their male counterparts. So don't assume that female athletes are the weak link. It's not as simple as just hit it towards the female players. That's not a good strategy. It'll get you into some trouble, as we've seen in the tournaments and games we've played so far. So that's a basic example of no runners on hitting strategy. Now we'll look at the strategy with a runner on first and less than two outs. The runner on first is in gray. In this situation, the batter tries to find a gap in between the first baseman and second baseman or the third baseman and the shortstop. The reason for that is that you want to stay away from the middle of the field where the defense can more easily turn a double play. You also want to stay away from the lines because a foul ball, remember, is an out. You don't get any strikes, a foul ball is an out. So here your goal is at the very least to advance the runner into scoring position, be that second or third base. Stay away from the midfielder, stay away from a double play. Moving on to a situation with a runner on second base and less than two outs. Here the batter tries to find a gap on the right side of the field behind the runner. Again, your primary objective as the batter is to move the runner along. Get that runner at the very least to third base. You also want to stay away from the center of the field because there's still some double play possibilities for the defense. If you hit it to the midfielder or the shortstop, you could be looking at a tag him out, throw him out, double play. And again, try to stay away from the lines so you don't put yourself in danger of a foul ball being ruled an out. Again, at least try to move that runner to third and don't hit it to the left side where there's a lot more chance that the defense can turn a double play. And this is something you will have worked on in practice with the cone drills, cones four and five on the screen. That's where you want to hit it with a man on second and fewer than two outs. Now things get a little bit more complex in this last situation that we'll look at which is with a runner on third base and less than two outs. The runner's in gray on third. Here the batter tries to find a gap in the center of the field, forcing the longest possible throw to home plate in terms of distance. However, if there's also a runner at first base, things change because you'd kind of want to avoid the middle of the field and avoid a double play possibility. Hitting the ball to first base is not usually the best option here because with the third baseman covering home, the throw from first is the easiest play for the defense to make at home plate. So you're trying to find gaps on the left side and up the middle. And your players, your hitters, will have all practiced hitting those gaps. 
So when it comes time to do it in a game situation, they're prepared. Third baseman, we should also note, oftentimes plays in in front of the bag when there's a runner on third. That way they can go in towards home plate to take a throw. So, as a hitter, you want to take note of that. Is the third baseman in tight? If they are, like we saw in the last video, though, it was the shortstop, not the third baseman. But if there's a defender in tight, try to hit something at their feet because it's really hard to react that quickly and make a play when you're in close and the ball's hit at your feet. So these are just some examples. And obviously, your team will have different strengths and different strategies, but something to think about as you start to build your strategy. In previous modules, we covered standard hitting strategy with runners on all bases. So once this webinar is over, please review what we've suggested and then watch the full game again. I'm sure you'll realize something new each time you watch it. And there's a lot to take away from that one game that's not even 20 minutes long. Really a perfect example of Baseball 5. Now we'll move on to the final piece of this presentation, practice planning. We'll discuss practice and the ways that you can best set up your team for success. Of course, there's not a one-size-fits-all perfect plan that works for everybody. You know the availability of your players, availability of equipment, time, space, fields, etc. So just try to adapt these ideas that we're going to present to your situation. Be flexible. And remember, it takes time, dedication, and a lot of repetitions to see improvement. Stay focused and don't give up. You're the coach. The main actors are your players. You have to put in all of your effort and energy if you want to get the same back from your players. So lead by example. Your players will win the games, but you can prepare them to be winners. That being said, we'll now go through the WBSC Coach Commission pillars, our coaching philosophy. It takes time to find the right structure. You must build the foundation. You can have the best drills, but it's the way the practice flows that is important to the success of the team and the program. So in other words, organization with your players, with other coaches is key. Work with your coaching staff. Ask them what they think your team should work on on any specific day. Players are not perfect, so keep that in mind. They won't be perfect, but their effort can be and it must be. Effort and energy must consistently be at a high level in practice. So repetitions, repetitions, repeat, repeat. And that goes for everything. It goes for driving, riding a bike, and hitting a well-placed baseball five single. The more you practice, it just becomes automatic. Something to keep in mind is that progression during the season should be your goal. You want to get better and better the more you play, and you want to see that reflected in your players. Don't be lax when it comes to timing. Timelines are vital. You have to stay within the structure that you have outlined. And you have to start every practice with dynamic stretching. Do it the same way every day to help build routines. Beyond that, find a spot every day for player development. One day, maybe focus on a hitting routine. One day, focus on defense to stay balanced. And as you'll see very shortly, we have a recipe that we can share with you for a five-day practice plan. Make a checklist of every game situation that has come up and that might need work. You have to work on what is important for your philosophy. So stay coherent and stay consistent. And as promised, now we will look at an example of how you can structure your practice in, floor, in four blocks. The four blocks we have outlined here are a 15 to 30 minute warm-up, stretching, and catch period, 20 to 30 minutes of player development, 
where you work on improvement of one of the fundamentals through drills. And those fundamentals could be base running one day, catch and throw, fielding, hitting. Mix it up so it's not the same every day. After you work on player development, we suggest 20 to 30 minutes of routine drills for game situations. And then finally, you can close practice with a game where you put in play everything that you did in the previous blocks. Don't try to do everything every day. Focus on something specific for the day and try to achieve a specific goal. Something that I want to add that you see at the bottom of the slide is very important, and we'll talk, talk about it as we go through the example days, is that you have to give your players time to absorb what they're learning. Take a five-minute break after every topic. Give your players time to drink, reset their mind, and rest their bodies. Get ready for what's next. And then after everything's done, we suggest closing with a five-minute debrief to discuss what was accomplished with the players. So now we'll see a sample plan of five different practice days. Doesn't matter if you practice twice a week, three times a week, or even just one day a week. You should do it in a cycle of five practices. And once you've completed your five practices, if you did it in a week, if you did it in three weeks, go back to number one and keep your players in a good routine. So here's an example of day one. It begins with the warm-up and catch period. And remember the order of warm-ups. Dynamic stretching, dynamic exercises, I should say, then more traditional stretching and catch. And on our day one for player development, we'll work on hitting technique. Sometimes you don't even have players hitting the ball when they're working on their technique. After that, you move on to the routine portion of practice. And it's having your defensive players get ready to field hard hit balls and throwing to first base. And we say have them work on the throw to first base on day one because it's the most common play. So once you've worked on those three pieces, then you get into a game and you put it into action, everything that you've been working on and talking about. Moving on to day two. Dynamic exercises, stretching, and catch to get everybody loose, everybody warmed up and mentally alert. Then for player development on day two, we suggest fielding drills. And you may have come up with some of these on your own, or you may have used some of our examples from previous modules. After fielding practice, get into batting practice. And day two is a great time to bring out those cones or whatever markers you have. And have them hit in between the cones, in between defenders. Have your players hitting with a purpose, not just smacking the ball out there. After that, try to put that batting practice, those cone drills, into a game situation. While at the same time, having your fielders do the same. Day three, your players are getting into the routine of these dynamic exercises, stretching and catch. And then we're going to get into base running because it's really important how quickly you get out of the batter's box. And also, it's important to be able to stop yourself at first base in that safe area that we've talked about. So work both on getting out of the box quickly, but also slamming on the brakes once you've reached first base safe. You don't want to have to be tagged out when you were at first ruled safe because you overran the safe area, which we saw in an earlier example. Then after your base running drills, more defense drills, more hard hit balls. This time with your players working on throwing to second base, because as you just saw in the example video, it's almost as common to make outs at second as it is at first. This is where your underhand flips are going to come into play. Then it's game time, and it's games that are being played not solely for fun, though it is important that your players have fun at practice, but play these games with purpose. Day four comes along, and by now everybody is into their dynamic exercises and stretching routines and getting better and better and more careful at playing catch. For our player development, we're going to work on hitting on day four, 
setting up targets at first and second base. So you're going to focus solely on hitting to the right side of the field, advancing runners who are on second base, or sometimes even runners who are on first. After that, get into some batting practice. Pull out the cones if you want, or whatever other batting practice drills that you've established with your program. And then play a game. And by now, these games are going to be very competitive. Day five is upon us. And the team is into dynamic exercises, stretching and catch. And maybe you have a team captain or two who leads these stretching and dynamic exercise portions of practice. Once everybody's warmed up, we focus on defense on day five. Defense, so important, as you saw in that example video. You see under development, we have listed defensive movements with runners. That's avoiding collisions with runners. Keeping an eye on the ball as you also have to deal with runners running towards you. It's not easy, so a good thing to focus on for player development. For the routine portion of day five, more hard hit balls at defenders. This time, they're working on throwing to home plate. And this is important for the entire team. You need to keep everybody moving. You need to work on your communication here. Who covers home in what situations? Vitally important to the entire Baseball 5 experience. Finally, it's Day 5 games, and by now, maybe you even have some inter-squad rivalries developing. The games are certainly going to be competitive, and everybody's having a good time and unwinding. And one thing I didn't mention in any of these five days, but I will repeat it as I said it at the beginning, give your players time in between all these different blocks to hydrate, rest, and reset. You don't want to rush somebody from their player development practice into their batting practice without giving them a five-minute breather. Chance to get some water. Oftentimes it'll be really hot. And also a little mental reset to go from defense to offense. Obviously... Not on day five, it's all defense, but still, a reset is important. So with all that said, we'll remind you that this is just an example of a five-day practice plan, and we don't expect you to follow it to the letter, but it is a great guide to set up your team for success. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, our Baseball 5 webinar has come to an end. We thank you for your attention and participation and wish you all the best of luck as you take Baseball 5 home and introduce it to the very first generation of Baseball 5 players all over the world.